Hey, everybody. Happy Sunday. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Kelly Barrett. This is Etc. Live. I am super proud to have my guest back for his second visit on the show. Uh, he is a member of one of the best uh, double platinum album selling bands to ever come out of Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jeff Neal of Streetheart. Hi, everybody. Hi, Jeff. Kelly. How are you? Hi. I am so good. It's so good to see you. It's great to see you, too. So glad to have you back. You know, I was just thinking before the show that things are looking so much brighter in certain respects than they did the last time you were on the show because you were here during the pandemic and we were all locked down and not much was going on and and things are turning around now well it's uh, it's been a long road for not only for us but for everybody in our industry and i mean i mean everybody around the world really um and it's just nice we got to do uh, a handful of shows last year which we were very grateful for i think we might have played eight shows we had to cancel a few because you know, the pandemic, the COVID thing is still kind of finding its way. Uh, we're still finding our way back to normal. But this uh, summer has been, uh, right now, we currently have 18 shows on the on the board. So, and we're going to be traveling between uh, British Columbia and Ontario. We're hopeful we're going to get out to the East Coast. We have nothing yet. We've had a few offers, but uh, we hope we can get out to there before the year is up. But we're pretty excited about getting out there and playing. Although this uh, touring right now has its challenges. <laughs> We were just talking about that before mm -hmm. the show a little bit. And, and uh, you know, there's challenges and not so much with getting the work because I think the work is not the issue. It's out there and people want to see street art. It's absolutely than, it's the traveling that's causing a bit of a well, pain. Well, uh, yeah, it, it, that's exactly what it is. Uh, I know our audiences and the fans have been incredibly enthusiastic and all of our colleagues have been having some great shows. But having said that, a lot of our colleagues have talked about these problems they're having, getting stranded, losing luggage, having flights changed. Uh, as you and I spoke about earlier, just trying to rent cars or yeah. trucks or SUVs is literally impossible. Anyone that's tried to rent a vehicle from one of the major rental companies, were, or they probably experience the same thing as I have, which <laughs> says, we have no cars, try another date. I go, I have to play on this date. Um, yeah, but but fortunately, we found a few alternatives and uh, we've been a bit creative. So, you know, sometimes um, difficult times makes you uh, be a little bit, you know, you, you dig in a little bit deeper and you find a solution. Yeah, you just have to be a little di a little diverse and a little uh, thinking outside the box. I would imagine. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But yeah, well, and uh, and so, Jeff, I'm just curious since like I, I almost want to say post pandemic and it's not that it's over. But what are some of the other, you know, changes or, or things that have taken place as far as how has it changed touring otherwise? Is there any is there any other sort of challenges that you've had to face? Is there still the same number of shows as there was pre pandemic? Well, uh, I would say that uh, uh, before Kenny passed, sort of in the sort of around sort of from say two thousand and. Uh, eight to say 2016, we would typically do sort of between 30 and 40 shows a year, uh, which was um, a good number of shows, more than some yeah. bands, less than less than some bands, but it was, it was that worked out well for us. Um, uh, it, I think it's it's going to take a little bit of time to get back to that those same types of numbers. But again, having said that, um, the shows that we do have, we're really looking forward to. They're all great shows. Uh, uh, the summertime is a lot of outdoor festivals and uh, it's going to be nice to play some shows and see some of our friends and colleagues again and watch them play their music and have them stand on the side of the stage and, you know, go like this at us when we're playing. <laughs> no, and just seeing the fans again. I mean, uh, uh, Kelly, uh, we've been playing, uh, Street Heart's been going for so long that our, so many of our fans, they're friends now. I mean, we see yes. this, we've seen the same faces and we've all grown up together and we've been traveling down this road together with like this big bunch in a party bus kind of thing uh, for, <laughs> for, for over, literally over 40 years. And uh, I think, you know, of all the gifts that we have in this life, I think the long ride is and having everybody travel with us uh, all these decades has been, uh, that's been the great gift, I think, for us. I would imagine. And you know what's so cool, Jeff? A lot of those people you're talking about are already in the house. They're all, they're all just yeah. kind of streaming okay. in. All right. Um, that's so, I, you know, and just to top off what we were just talking about, you know, Michelle Truman and I were talking about this and it's like, yes, there's travel issues and yes, things are getting maybe canceled or shifted and your luggage is getting lost, but it's, she said it perfectly. She said, you know, at the end of the day, the one thing everybody says is, it's so good to be back. Yeah. Isn't, it, isn't that how you sum it up? It's just so good to be back. Well, I think that Michelle makes a good point. It really is good to be back. And I know 
that we've done we've done a couple of shows so far this year. We're going to start getting real busy uh, in the next week and a half. Uh, um, but people have just the, the fans have been so grateful for the music. I mean, not just for us, but for just for music and entertainment and and getting out and kind of re remem remembering what it's like to kind of be normal, whatever that is. They're kind of getting back to that again. And so that's uh, that's a real nice experience. Right. And, you know, Jeff, before we get to some of the fans, let's talk about that for a minute. You know, Street Art has been around, as you just said, for 40 plus years. Mm -hmm. People still want to come and see you. Your music is still relevant. The longevity is there. And I wonder, what do you think it is about Street Art songs that have that kind of mass appeal, you know, then and now where people and now their generations of children are street art fans. What do you think that is? Um, well, I think, I mean, the original street art were, um, was an amazing lineup. Uh, street art fans know this. The original lineup was Kenny Shields, uh, Spider Sinead, Eve, Daryl Gutel, Paul Dean and Matthew Frenette. Uh, I was a huge fan of that band. Like, you know, like so many other people uh, and they, they were, great players. They had a great chemistry as a band and they were great songwriters as a collective. And I think that the, the songwriting uh, through the different lines when, after John Hanna came in, when I joined the band in 1981, I think we really focused on songwriting and, and uh, we wrote good songs and songs that we're, we're lucky enough that uh, they got on the charts. Uh, we uh, last year, uh, we had a total of 21 different tracks played across Canada over the course of the year. I mean, not so not only our hits, but also deeper cuts. Right. Uh, so that's really something for us. I mean, that's a pretty, we have a, a wonderful problem that we have probably 12 or 13 songs that we have to play every night. That so people expect to hear. Right? That people want to hear. Yes. And I mean, and, and I, as a fan, when I go see a, a band that I love, and that I followed, I want to hear those, those songs that, you know, that, that, that bring back the magic for you. And a lot of them are the hits because you, they were, they were part of your life. Uh, they were on the radio, they were playing in your car. So they become, they they become indelibly stamped uh, in your memory banks. And uh, so, I mean, you, you're asking what makes it so special. We are lucky enough to have a lot of hits, uh, hit songs. So when we play, we can play for 90 minutes and, and, Pretty much everyone in the house knows every every single one of those songs. Absolutely. And you're so right, Jeff, because as you were just saying that now, it, it, it popped into my head that the first time I heard Tin Soldier, mm -hmm. I was riding around in a car with a boy. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I remember hearing that, that whole album when I was, you know, and probably with a, a boy that wasn't someone I should have been riding around with. <laughs> well, okay. All right. <laughs> my, mother, my mother would say. But uh, no, I remember riding around and, and, and that's the first time I ever heard Street Art and and I and I that song is still on my playlist. I was listening to it as I was getting ready for the show and and uh, yeah, to have that type of longevity that people still I mean that's the mark of good songwriting. And I you know I was thinking about this earlier. I wonder and I you know maybe every generation Jeff feels this about their music. I worry, I almost worry that is this the last of the great bands that popped up in the eighties and nineties that have this type of longevity where 20 years later, we're still paying money to go see them. And I worry because I don't necessarily know that the bands that came out in early 2000 are going to be commanding the same, you know, longevity and attention in 20 years. And, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm curious of your opinion. Is that just me? Or how do you feel about that? Um, well, I think about that a lot. Um, I think that uh, a street heart and all of our colleagues came up at an incredibly like this amazing time we're yeah. we're so incredibly fortunate um because the music was important uh socially it was very important i mean we grew up buying records uh and it was the only buying vinyl buying an album and it was the only connection you had with the band was was that record that you got once a year and any, and this, and the print that was in the, uh, the liner notes, you read it and you read it and you read the lyrics and you read everything. You had every single word that was on that album. Cause it was really all you ever knew. There was no internet. So if you wanted to hear some new music that you didn't have, you went to your friend's house. That's right. And, he, and, and listen to their records and, and maybe you, you picked your friends because you had this connection. You see the record collection you go, Wow, you have wow. that album. I have that album too. I like you. You're yeah, I'm friend. gonna hang with you. Yeah, I want to hang with you. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 and you know, I mean, the cultures change so much. I mean, as great as the internet is, and as wonderful as it is, 
Um, I think it's taken away some of that magic, the, the importance, like uh, artists were, 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 they were important. They were important yeah. people. Hey, I've got my, I've, I've got little Lola Bean here. Nobody can see her, but there it is. I've got both dogs up here. I'm on dog <laughs> patrol tonight. But I, 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 I mean, there are, there's, there's great new music. There really, truly is great new music, but there's so many artists out there. It's, it's hard to find any music. And every once in a while, someone will play something and I just go, wow, it just knocks me out. Um, but getting, sorry, getting back to your question, um, I think in 300 years time, I think that musical historians will look back on this time period, a very short time period from about maybe 1955 to about maybe 1985, 1990 and go, this was kind of like a golden age of, of yeah. pop music. You know, this is when the great masters, Lennon McCartney, uh, Prince, uh, Pete Townsend, oh, I mean, you know, pick it, uh, Jagger, Richards. I mean, all these great songwriters, great artists, uh, they will look back at these as the real pop masters. And um, it remains to be seen. I mean, you know, per, you know, there may be another, is there going to, could there be another Beatles? I don't know about that. I, I think the timing was, it was the perfect storm for that to happen. Right. I agree, Jeff. And I, and so I, no, no, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I was just going to close this. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, we grew up in this perfect storm yes. where people, you know, what came out of World War II uh, and the British invasion happened. America was growing. I mean, there was Motown, uh, Muscle Shoals, Memphis, uh, and all this incredible music that was going on. And we just, we were just lucky enough to have come through this time period. And I really hope that, uh, younger kids in their own way get to kind of feel that same kind of magic at some point. I think in to some ways, because I feel, you know, I feel so grateful to have been a part of this musical era for sure. Um, but, and I, and I was thinking, I kind of feel sad for the kids that, that may not experience that, but I think a lot of them are gravitating towards the older music. Yeah. I think, I think they're getting yeah. it and they're grabbing onto it. Yeah. Like, I, like have, I, would, I would imagine Jeff, when you perform a show, there's, there's generations there. Yes, there are. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's kind of a neat thing. One of my favorite stories is, I was having a couple, three young guys come up to me to go, "Hey, man, like we've been playing my, we've been playing my dad's records of you guys. You guys can really play, you know." And I go, you know, and they go, "Wow, that's so great." And I go, I go, well, you know, we were lucky enough. And again, this is here's another thing. I started playing professionally at 18 years old, right? And I started playing nightclubs. I played nightclubs six nights a week, 52 weeks a year, you know, six seven hours a night we play you know we did we did three minimum three four sometimes four and a half sets a night you get good when we can make a living you know we used to be able to make a living we traveled back and forth across western canada developing our craft getting our ten thousand hours uh, i don't think that young musicians now have that same luxury right. to be able to do that you know it's gotta be it's gotta be hard for the newer ones trying to start out to even just cut the, you know cut their teeth and get their chops up Oh, well, they don't get paid. I mean, you know, you know, the, 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 the music has such little value. It's I find it very interesting that a single was a dollar when I was a kid. It's still a dollar, you know, or it's free. You don't even have to pay for it if you don't want to, if you're great. Right. Right. Yeah, no, I would agree. And I just, I think that I just like, again, I feel so lucky to be a part of that. And, uh, you know, and aside from the Canadian artists, you know, like, like you mentioned, the Zeppelins and the Bowies and the, the Pink Floyds and all that. But uh, anyway, we're going to get to speaking of some of your fans that have been following you all these times and uh, for 40 years and there was a okay. bunch of them here. So let's just say, hello, Steve Jensen is, is clapping. Hey, Hi, Steve. Steve. <laughs> Adele Wilding is in the house. Hi, Adele. Uh, she says, two of my favorite people. Good evening, Kelly Barrett and Jeff Neal. Uh, oh, oh, that's Hi, great. It's nice. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. It's really, it's, it's great. It, thanks for taking the time. It's nice. 100%. Lisa Guliak's in the house. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. We love you. She's like big love. I don't guys. have a black t-shirt on. <laughs> so Lisa, for those of you watching, is uh, the premier photographer to all our Canadian rock icons. Oh, she's the best. She provided all the promo for Jeff's, uh, for the promotional material for Jeff's show tonight. So it's good to see her. Uh, Marlene Lynch. Hello, Doug Corby. Barb Sim. Dave Mitchell. They're Isn't just coming good? in. Oh, yeah. it's just, it's just, I mean, these are all friends uh, that, that I communicate with all the time. And I mean, the, it's one of the beauties of social media. This is, uh, is that we can stay in contact. I mean, you know, you have to, you got to balance yourself because you can't, 
you know, people, sometimes people get in trouble, but in general, it's just such a great thing. And it's just so nice to be sitting here tonight and having a bunch of friends come and join us. 100%. And actually, Michelle Truman is in the house, too. I just nice. Her. Hi, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's here. That's awesome. Yeah, nice. So, Jeff, I'm wondering, you did you did touch a bit on the, on the initial lineup of Street Art, and I'm wondering if you could just take us through, uh, in a nutshell, kind of a timeline Okay. Uh, from 1981, when you when you kind of took over, and for for until '83, I think it was, and you, and then shortly after, you joined Street Art's self titled album came out, and and it's probably the biggest album to date in the catalog. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's our, our biggest seller. Uh, I mean, it it had we had five singles off of it, so it did very very well for us, and it was really that was a culmination of a year of songwriting. Uh, when I first joined the band, uh, we would spend uh, every day we'd go over to uh, we'd go over to Kenny's apartment and uh, we'd get together and sit around Kenny's kitchen table with acoustic guitars and pads of paper and pencils. And we would start putting, you know, I've got this idea. How about this? I've got this part here. Uh, have you got anything for it? And we just started and we wrote songs, just basically stripped down versions of songs we felt that if it could stand up with just acoustic uh, guitars and, and voice and this, and the, the body of the song was there, well, then maybe we had something and then we take it into the studio and play it as a band and see how it went from there. Um, uh, so I, I think that that street heart album definitely was a, was that's the reward you get for working hard and working consistently. I mean, we wrote a lot of songs for that record. Uh, I, and that wouldn't be the only story like that. And I, I mean, I've heard stories about Michael Jackson looked at 300 songs for Thriller. And Can you picked, imagine? I think the album had nine or 10 maybe, but he, they, 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 so I, 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 we just didn't write 10 songs and go in the studio. We wrote probably 30 or 40 songs. Right. Uh, and then nine of them made the record. Right. And what, I'm curious, Jeff, what was this, the, the songwriting process like back in those early days? Was it a collaborative, collaborative sort of effort or? Yeah, I would say that. Uh, I, I know you co-wrote, you co-wrote quite a few of the songs on that. Yeah, well, yeah. well I mean, uh, when I joined the band, we worked as an equal partnership collective, myself and Kenny and Spider and Daryl. Uh, it didn't really matter where the idea came from. Um, we would all we would all share equally in that, um, but typically one one of us would come with a, a genesis of an idea, uh, um, a song like "What Kind of Love Is This." Daryl had a verse and a lead up. Don't you uh, don't ever think it's gonna be better? I'm waiting in line in my time, getting all the love, love, love in your eyes. And he goes, and I went, I have this piece. Boom, boom. What kind? of the and they just kind of went together wow you know so that it was and those were two separate parts i had had that chorus idea and the kind of the intro kind of hanging around it was one of the things i had in my pocket when i came to the band so uh and you know we, we that's typically how we sort of wrote and you know kenny would interject he go oh i like that melody okay can i just change it a little bit here can i just do this make it my own i mean kenny was a master of that kenny yeah Kenny Shields uh, was, he was, he made you, when you, when he sang a song, you believed him. You believed yes. every single word he said and sang. Um, uh, you know, that was, that was his magic, part of his magic. Uh, also that he was probably the best front man on the planet. Frontman, the I was just going to say 100%. <laughs> and I'm, I'm curious, Jeff, is there, are any songs written about actual people or experiences? Um, I'm sure that they are. I mean, I, I mean, certainly all of my songs come from real life experiences. Uh, I, I, you know, there's like a song like Teenage Rage, which is a song that Spider Sinev wrote. Right. That's, that's a true story. That is an actual true story about um, they were at the Native Club. Uh, I, I think maybe I, I wish Spider was here to tell this story, but I think he might have been at the Native Club and there was a girl dancing wearing a Red Canadian flag. flag. And so it's this, this, the lyrics of the song are basically telling a real life story. And it was kind of, and, there, and I guess Spider was watching this girl going, wow, I wonder where she's going to be in five years. Right. And which became a hook line to the song. Right. And, I, you know, I think as an artist and as writers, we have to document whenever we get an idea. You know, it's really important. 
I mean, it's important to have the craft and go to do your work, go to your office, like this place behind me. And you just sit down and you start to write. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I had a number of years ago, I was having lunch uh, with Jim Valance. Jim Valance, you know, was, was the songwriting partner for Brian Adams. Brian Adams yeah. And we were just talking about that. And, you know, and he talked about the secret to their success was 15 years, 12 hours a day, six days a week. Writing. They start at noon and they would go to midnight every day except Sunday. They did it for 15 years. Just like a full-time job. That's your a, job. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. It's a craft, you know, and, 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 but you also have to, um, I think it's really important to embellish craft with inspiration too. You know, I mean, cause there are moments when you just get something and it's just, you know, it's some gift from the universe or whatever that is. Uh, inspiration happens and you need to be always as a writer. I think you have to, document that stuff and not let it not lose it i've lost more good ideas than i've kept over the years right because you think about it and, and inspiration can come in the most unlikeliest places and in the most inopportune times like when mm -hmm. you don't have a pen pencil and paper mm -hmm. and it and it can be gone but uh oh hey Dwayne watson i just want to give a shout out to him and gary jones no there's guys. a great songwriter Dwayne watson yes. that man is a great <laughs> songwriter Dwayne. Brother, yeah. Brother, I'm glad to have you in the house. Might have to have him on the yeah. show sometime, I'm mm. thinking. Yeah, no, uh, you should. You should. Yeah. The, 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 this is a very interesting man. And he is just, he's got a heart of gold. And he's a great songwriter. And I think that he'd be, he'd, he'd be a worthy guest to have on the show. Well, there you go, Dwayne. I'm going to have your people call my people. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Do you have a favorite Streetheart song, Jeff? Is there one that you never get sick of? Oh, yeah, Action. That yeah. is my favorite, too. That it's, is, oh. It, it's it's such an amazing song. It's just it, it's a it, it's not so much the song. Like if you break if you broke it down, there's not a lot to it. It's only a couple of chords, but it's this. It's the long, dynamics. It's this it's, long slow curve that builds and builds yeah. and builds. And Kenny tells this kind of the dark sort of story that you don't really know what it is. Is just you catch little snippets of it, and and it just has. It, it's still, I, I get a thrill playing that song, playing Paul Dean's guitar parts, which I love. I mean, I was such a fan when that song came out. I just, I, I, I was just knocked out when I heard that song. And, I, and there's a lot of great Streetheart songs. Most of my favorites are ones that I didn't play them on. Because uh, I've always been a big fan of the band. I mean, I, I, I love the songs that I was part of. But I really, like both Paul Dean and John Hannon made such wonderful contributions. Hollywood, the one of John Hanna's songs. I love playing that song every night. Uh, that's one of our must plays. That's one of our oh, yeah. of must plays. Oh, yeah. We could never get away with not playing that. Somebody's <laughs> going to come up to us in the show going, hey, Hollywood. 100%. Mm -hmm. And Paul McNair does such an amazing job. I'm like, man, did you ever luck out when you found well, Paul McNair? Wow. He's, he, he, Paul, I, I, and I, say, I don't know what we do if we, if we didn't have Paul because... <clears throat> the, what I really respect about Paul is that he has a great respect for the legacy of this band. He was a, right. he was like many other singers, like all other singers in Winnipeg. They were all fans of Kenny's. They wanted, they, they wanted to not be like Kenny, but he was a great mentor to them all just for as sure. a singer. Um, and when he came into this band, uh, you know, he was so respectful of the legacy of this band and he didn't try to sing the songs like Kenny because Kenny's a one of a kind singer. You know, you don't, find that type of a singer multiple times in this life. No, you don't. But Paul in his own right is a great singer and he can sing a very, very difficult catalog of songs night after night after night. And he's a great, he's a great front man for the band. He is. People really like him. He's a real, he's a real, he's got lots of forward energy. He's, he's fun. And I think that he really makes our shows. I think people, can focus on the, the memories of this band and they can think a little bit about Kenny, but they still have this great quality of music and this great singer singing these tunes. And it's a real, it's a real honor to be up there with him. Right. right. Yeah. He is. He was on the show and I saw you guys last year at rock the river. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was the first time I had heard Paul live do the songs. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, you, you want to carry on with a certain amount of honor, but with your own personality. And I really think the bottom line is people just want to continue to hear the music. They just yeah. want these songs to go on and uh, you know, and, he, and, and I'm just curious, Jeff, and I hope it's okay if I ask this, was there ever a time after Kenny's passing where the band thought, you know, that maybe that's it. Like it's over. Um, 
I, I, after Kenny passed uh, in uh, July of 2017, we just we did it. We did a tribute for him in August, and then we just kind of uh, we just kind of took it, an exhale, uh, you know, because we didn't really know what we were going to do. We didn't really talk about it. Uh, a few months later, we thought, oh, yeah. And I started getting a few messages from fans, just kind of you know, sending their condolences and. And people would start saying, well, we hope you guys, you know, maybe you might go on, you know, maybe you might continue to play. And it, it's, we knew that it'd be very difficult because Kenny was such a critical, important part of the Street Heart sound. I mean, Kenny Shields is an, is an integral part of Street Heart and he always will be. I mean, it's his voice you're going to hear on the radio every day. Right. Uh, and you always will. And that voice will be singing across the airwaves long after we're all way gone. 100%. Uh, uh, but, um, you know, we started talking to fans and we, we would just sort of ask them. Uh, I remember Daryl and I, we did a, um, uh, we did a, 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 a used record and CD sale here that they do called Rock and Richards. Right. A CD sale. And we came and we were invited to come out and be at one of the tables and we were talking to fans. And this was after Kenny had passed. It was the fall of 2017. And, you know, people came up and they were saying, hey, it's great. To see. And they were saying, we're so sorry about this. And they were really, everybody was so kind. But then they would kind of say, we hope that you guys might think about going on, yeah. you know. Uh, and and we kind of started thinking about that. And Paul had done such a good job for uh, at Kenny's tribute. I mean, all the singers that sang with us that night were wonderful. But Paul sang the bulk of the songs and did a great job and sang with the original lineup of Street Heart, you know, and... You know, you know, Paul Dean said, "This Jeff, this guy's this guy's a great singer. If you were thinking of going on, I, 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 I this guy's a good choice." Um, so it it was kind of a you know, but we knew that we 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 just couldn't get out there right away. I mean, we just you know, right. your hearts are kind of heavy, and it's just with respect. It's almost to, a respect thing too. Right? It was, no, it was just all about say respect. That. Yeah, right. it's all about respect. Yeah. I mean. Again, the, we, we, the, the love and appreciation and respect we have for Kenny Shields and his contribution to the legacy of this band, it deserves so much. And uh, I, I'm, I'm just so grateful that we were able to continue on and the fans have accepted Paul uh, and, and they've embraced him. And, and that we've had an opportunity to start playing shows again with, 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 with uh, Spider Sineve. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to have him back in the band. I mean, you know, this he's arguably Canada's greatest rock bass player. I don't know. 100%. If yeah. he's not the best, tell me who is. He's up there, yeah. Yeah, you know. Um, so it's uh, <clears throat> all the good things that have happened to us in the in the past five years, uh, you know, the, the goodwill from the fans. Uh, we, we can't, we never discount that. I mean, that just means so much. That means everything to us. I mean, the fans are everything. I mean, I say this, if we the fans weren't there, we wouldn't exist. No bands would exist without the fans. Right. And, and you know, I think you guys have always acknowledged that. You've always, you know, I have a couple of that, just quick little anecdotes about Kenny. And and this is actually an interesting fact. And we've talked about this before, but there's a lot of people that haven't, didn't see the last show. Uh, so I grew up in Regina. And of course, if you lived in Regina, you were street art fans. Mm. You, you know, you just, and uh, so there was used to be, you know, those pageants and there was the Miss Teen Regina pageant. Okay. And one of the questions that they would ask for you to go to the next level, they would show you a picture of mm -hmm. Kenny Shields. And if you didn't know who it was, you were down the road, sister. There was <laughs> no crown for you. Do not uh, collect you. Under no crown for you. <laughs> Back of the line. No suit for you either. <laughs> so that, I mean, what a testament to, to, I mean, what a piece of history that he was, that that would be part of that. Like, if you don't know who this is, you don't qualify to represent yeah. this city. Um, and another really interesting was, and this gets back to how Kenny was as a human. Um, and so inter we, my band was on the road back in, oh my God, it must've been the nineties. And uh, we were playing in some Alberta town and we were doing six nighters back then as, as you were talking about, right. it was in West, Westlock, Alberta. And sometime around Wednesday, Wednesday, the manager came to us and said, Hey guys, you know, I don't know if this is good news or bad news, but you're not playing Saturday night. And um, because we're getting street heart, we had it, we had an opportunity we couldn't refuse, you know, but I'll, I'll, I'll put you guys up for the night. I'll give you a bar tab. You're welcome to watch the show. 
Right. And he, he was kind of like, sorry. And I was like, are you freaking kidding me? I've been mm -hmm. on the road for 15 years. I don't get to see anything. And mm -hmm. my favorite band mm -hmm. is going to play on the stage that we were on the night before. And we get to watch, you know, hell. Anyway. And so we, uh, you know, just the best night ever. And, and I uh, got to see the band. And anyway, the next day we were having breakfast. A bunch of us got together and had breakfast with Kenny. And there was this single, I'm assuming it was a single mother sitting across from us. And she just had kids everywhere. And she just... Mm -hmm. You know, her kids were eating, but she wasn't really eating anything but toast. And like, you could just get a picture of her life mm -hmm. and she's stressed and the kids are crying and whatever. And anyway, mm -hmm. one, one of the kids throws his Smarties on the floor. She gets up with the other one and just goes to the bathroom, ready to have a breakdown. Kenny gets up, picks up the Smarties, goes to the cash register, buys the kids all new Smarties and takes care of their entire bill. Yeah. yeah and I'm you know, kind of man he was. I will never forget that. Mm -hmm. No, he was, a, he was, a, yeah. On that level, he was just such a great human being. I mean, I know he had a he had a huge heart. He had a very very he had a big huge kind heart. And, and, sp uh, and speaking of that, Jeff, sorry, I just I have to say this too because you, Jeff Neal, your name is literally synonymous in the Canadian music industry with just being a solid, decent human. You know, and I, like when I posted about this show, the comments were coming. Great guy. You know, the music doesn't get mentioned because that's a given. Mm -hmm. People are your fans because they love what you do musically. But comment after comment about what a decent human you are, what a solid guy, what a great guy, nicest guy ever, loves his fans, so gracious. And I'm, how do how does that make you feel to hear that? Well, I'm, I'm pretty humbled by that stuff. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I'm, I, I think that uh, growing up with the, the family that I did, my parents, they were my parents never took advantage of people right. in their lives. Uh, the, that's the one thing, you know, our, our parents, our parents are not never perfect, but they are, but, but my, mom and dad were, they, they really, they, they never took advantage of people and they, and they taught me a lot about being about, about gratitude and about always, and just sort of being, I like, I don't really feel, I feel kind of lucky. I feel very, very lucky. I kind of feel like I snuck up on stage. And I'm still waiting to be tossed off. You know, how did I get up here? You know, right. um, but, but I also appreciate as a, as a fan of uh, as a, a music fan myself, uh, I've had wonderful experiences with artists who I've respected and and admired. And I've also had not so good experiences with artists that I've respected and admired. And, and I think very early on, I kind of made a choice don't be that one you know like yeah. make the time for people uh, uh i they are they're the the fans have you know put a roof over my head and groceries in my fridge uh and and that's the, i mean th th i never lose sight of that i mean that's just that's kind of a that's just part of who i am um uh, and i've also and i've been around some wonderful people uh in this business that have really taught me a lot about how to respect people and how to treat people and how to uh, put your best foot forward. You know, even when you don't want to put your best foot forward, you right. have to, you don't, right. you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't really have a choice. You know, it's your responsibility to do that. And I, and I don't mean responsibility and drudgery. In sort a bad of way. Way, yeah. I feel, I, I feel very, you know, I'm, you know, proud's not the right word, but you know what I mean? I mean, I feel Happy to do honored. Happy I feel to do honored to be able yes. to carry that mantle. And, uh, and I'll always try and put my best foot forward because everyone that I know deserves, deserves to be treated well. And I'm just going to continue to keep doing that to the best of my ability. 100%, Jeff. And you know, that, that was one of the first things I noticed about you when you were on the show the last time and I began, you know, collecting photos and whatnot, creeping your social media, basically. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. There's nothing up there that I, that I have to hide. So. <laughs> Not going to lie. Um, but, and I was collecting photos to use for promotional purposes okay and i noticed that you never post a photo without giving the photo credit and i thought that's class i'm gonna do that i'm gonna do that and i have done that ever since ever since you were on my show yeah kelly, i have done that yeah kelly i think it's i think it's a great thing it's it's how we honor all our uh, uh, friends who take photos and 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 document our shows they come out and do it for the love of the music uh you know, I mean, it, it gets their name out there a bit, but it's just, it, it's the idea that they come out and they, and they do it for free and they, and they take the time to do it. And I just, I have so many wonderful friends uh, and friendships uh, that I've made through, 
uh, meeting photographers who have taken some wonderful pictures and, 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 and do document what we do, what all of our bands do. Right. And, uh, and I think it's really important to acknowledge them every single time. Um, and, and I, you, People, again, people that I, professional people that I respect and admire, they take care of all those small details. And I try and, I, I try and emulate that as best as I can. Right. I love it. I love it. I, you know, and Michelle Truman is saying nicest guy on rock and roll. Now all the, now all the, Jeff is the best, not as a guitar player only, but as a human. Uh, I agree with Michelle Truman. Hi, Perry Boyko. Uh, you know, it's just, you know, and Ryan Dick, hi, a, a good friend and musician friend of mine. He's just loving the interview. You know, Jeff, I'm, I'm wondering if we could skip back a little bit. Could you yeah. tell us um, about the, I'm assuming, very pivotal meeting between you and Jimmy Barnes? Mm -hmm. um, are you talking, are, you, are we going back to the very beginning? Yeah, can you, when, when you, when you went on tour with Jimmy Barnes, because there's a certain incident I want to ask you about, but I'm assuming that was a pretty pivotal, 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 uh, important yes. person in your life. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, uh, well it's. The Jimmy Barnes uh, is, is, is it's a wonderful story. I had I had um, a street I broke up in 1984, and I moved back to Vancouver. Uh, I was just kind of doing session work and playing a few club dates and stuff like that, and kind of uh, you know I'm 27 years old, thinking oh my career is over. <laughs> um, and in, uh, in February of 19 and and I we're gonna back up uh, probably the beginning of 1986, maybe the end of 85. I started hearing a couple of tracks in Vancouver about, I was hearing about this Australian singer named Jimmy Barnes. And I, and the first song I heard by him was a song called No Second Prize. And it just kind of knocked me out. I said, this is, he kind of had that gravelly, gritty, kind of like a Bob Seger kind of voice to him. And a real, just a, a real, you know, real ballsy, really committed singer. Right. And then I, and then I'd heard that, Bruce Allen was uh, was going to was representing him to, in North America. Was bring, brought him over, and he had put a band together that had three local Vancouver musicians: uh, Pat Stewart, who's uh, played drums with Brian Adams and is cur currently out with Brian on the road; uh, Ab Bryant from uh, Chilliwack and the Headpins on bass; and Tom Lang was another Vancouver musician, guitar great guitar player, keyboard player, singer, and they had a guitar player named David um, Dave Amato. Uh, an American friend of Jimmy's playing guitar. Um, I got a call from from Bruce in February of 1986 asking if I could go out and go play with the Jimmy Barnes guy because, you know, that Amato guy's got to go off and do a tour with Cher, which was, you know, I mean, but that's, I mean, a, a Dave was, a, is a, a again, a, a real pro. A Dave's been actually with REO Speedwagon for the last oh, 25 years. Oh, wow. He replaced Gary Richrath back, I think, probably... Uh, probably somewhere in the late '80s, and he's and he's and he's continued to keep working with REO. Um, so I I came out and saw the band playing. I, uh, it, the funny thing was that it, Bruce said, "Listen, it's it's too late to get your to get your work visa. You're going to have to sneak across the border." So uh, <laughs> I I I, um, I got across. We I, we drove down to Seattle. Uh, I had my guitar with me and they were asked why I had my guitar. I said, well, I'm a professional guitar player. I need to practice all the time. Okay. We're going, we were on our way down for a little weekend in Seattle. We right. drove to Seattle. I got, I went with, we went straight to the airport. I got on the plane and flew to, I want to say it was Kansas city or St. Louis. It's either one of those two dates. I'd have to go back into an itinerary. Um, I watched the band play, got to meet everybody. And the next night we played. Okay. So it was, it was a Kansas city. The next night in St. Louis, I went, we played. We were the we were opening up for ZZ Top. Jimmy was the support uh, act for ZZ Top in 1986, and they were cresting. They were right at the crest of their career. Uh, so we were playing five shows a night. You know, so to between fifteen and twenty thousand people a night. Right. Uh, um, heart fifteen to twenty thousand hardcore ZZ Top fans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good times. Yo, good times. <laughs> no, it was no, it was it was great actually. Uh, the band was 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 fierce, you know. I mean, great players. Jimmy was was a monster singer, and uh, uh, and you, you got know, an offer. You got an offer at one point. Uh, okay, uh, that you turned down out of total integrity, and it, I think it was to open for the Stones. Oh, oh yeah, oh yes, oh yeah. Well, this the, uh, this was 
fast forward now to 19. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. No, no, Kelly, that's fine. Anyway, so uh, that was the beginning of my career was with that. We, we toured for three months with, uh, with ZZ Top. Right. Uh, and at the end of that tour, Jim came, uh, came up to me and said, Jeff, do you want to come down to Australia with me and play with my Australian band? You know, I, we had been butting heads the whole time. I thought, oh, this guy doesn't like me. I guess I thought, okay, it's going to be over in three months. I'm going home. And he said, I want you to come down and work with my band, you know, be part of the band. I'm like, okay. Um, so that, that began an 11 year career with, with Jimmy Barnes. Now we're going to fast forward to the summer of 1995. Uh, we had been touring. We'd been working really hard to break in Europe. Uh, we had uh, done a lot of big festivals. We had been touring with Brian Adams, uh, opening up for him throughout Europe. Um, and we got an opportunity to do a date uh, in Schutthof, Germany, with uh, opening up for the Rolling Stones. Well, being part of the bill for the Rolling Stones. Uh, the day was supposed to be the Stones were the headliner. Uh, the, open, the three opening acts were... It was started out with Big Country, then it was going to be yeah. Jimmy Barnes, then it was going to be Gary Moore. It was And he was supposed to be, well, Gary Moore got sick or couldn't make the show, so we got slotted to play, we got slotted to play right before the Stones. So we got to play for 90,000 of their closest friends. <laughs> And, Amazing. Uh, that and must have just, been insane. Well, it was, an, it, it was I, I, you know, if somebody said, can you pick the moment, the crest of your career? For me, it has to kind of be that date. Because about halfway through I set, I look over the monitor desk and Mick Jagger's watching the band play. There it is. That's what and I, I turn around the other side and Keith Richard is watching the band play with his, he's got his bodyguard with him watching the band play. I guess Did that scare you? Did that freak you out? No, no, no. I mean, I it was it was thrilling. It was just like, yes, this is <laughs> this is this is what it's all about. This is it. That you want to be in the show? This is it. Well, I guess apparently their stage manager, about three songs into our set, walked back to the stage and said, said, you need to get out and see this band. This is the best opening act we've had for 10 years. So they came out and watched us. And this was supposed to be a one-off show. Well, after the show. We got offered to do the rest of the dates in Germany. But that Rolling Stone show was supposed to be the last date of our tour. I talked about with Jimmy as management because I had got a call from Loverboy to come over and play in the U.S. with them because Paul, need, he had some family stuff that he had to take care of. And, he, and, the, and the management asked if I could fly over from Europe and come and do these shows in the U.S., which I was... You know, I was very, I was thrilled to do that, and very, very yeah. flattered to be to be asked. Um, and we know, and, and Jimmy, you know, he was fine. He said, "Yeah, Jeff, it's okay. No worries. I'm going away. I'm going. My family. We're going on a holiday. We've been on the road for three months. Go ahead." Well, Jimmy walks into the dressing room. Said his face is white, and he's going. We've just been offered the rest of the tour in Germany, at least. You know, so a, you know, maybe another five or six shows, and who knows where it would have gone from there. Yeah. And I'm going, oh. Oh, I, I'm, I'm leaving the next day to go to, to fly from Frankfurt to Vancouver to meet up with Loverboy to go rehearse for a day and then go on the road. And, you know, and I just said, oh, Jimmy. And he said, Jeff, it's okay. This is what we agreed on. You know, I, we can't go back on this. You have to go do these dates, you know, uh, with Loverboy. You've committed to them. And he tried to find another guitar player that maybe could sub for him, but it didn't work out. He just said, ah, whatever. I mean, I mean, Jimmy Barnes has done so many great things in his life, but it was just, it was a real testament. This is going back. Now you, we talk about people that have influenced us in a positive way. Right. Like Jimmy Barnes, the, the, I learned so much from him in my time with him. The, the man is so talented and has so much integrity and so much character. Uh, he makes you want to be a better person just being around right. him. He, he makes you find the best version of yourself every day. Right. I was going to say, Jeff, before you said I was going to, I was going to say, man, if that is not the epitome of integrity, I don't know what is. Uh, I like, like uh, wow. I have so, I have so much respect for him. I, 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 I can't find the words sometimes to say how much I admire the man. Uh, he, he's taught me so much about giving 110% every night or else. Right, right. You know, and that's how he was. 
he was challenging and inspiring at the same time every night. I love, love playing with Jimmy Barnes. And you know, Jeff, I have to say, honestly, judging by some of the comments, you have absolutely become that for other musicians. You know, Sean Tiedemann has, has said here that, you know, you were one of the guitarists that he, that he emulates and that he made him want to play guitar. And, and uh, I think that that's a certain, it comes a little bit of a responsibility that it comes with, but what an honor to think that people are now looking up to you and, and, you know, maybe getting interested in the business because of you and wanting to emulate what you do. Well, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And I will say that Sean, he's a, one of the hardest working guys that I know. He's got a, he's got a wide vision of what he's doing. He, he's always putting together great products and, 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 uh, and Sean and his wife, Sage, they're very good friends of mine. And I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm grateful for that. And, you know, again, I get inspired by other musicians always. I, I look for the inspiration. I look for the inspiration in other musicians. I, I want to see something in them that will make me go, you know, I could do that better. I can work on this and I can get better. I'm, I, you know, I'm after I've been doing, I've been playing professionally for 48 years. Right. And I still think I'm getting better. <laughs> There's always room to improve, right? There's Not my, my knees aren't, but, <laughs> uh, but I feel that I, I feel at some level that I am. And I, and I think that uh, we have such a great network of, of friends and, and yeah. friendships that we built. Uh, I could never let those friendships down, uh, not for not for the for the others, but for myself. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I I just I think being a good friend to someone is is really it's one of the best things that we can do, uh, and to be there for people when they need it, and to be able to offer some advice. I mean, I get you know I I get days where you don't even want to know me. You know, I always tell my friends when I'm not on social media, you don't want to know me because I'm I'm usually having a tough day. <laughs> I stay away from it rather than get on it. Well, and that's the smart thing to do, right? Have your mm -hmm. off day and and. Uh... Oh, listen, I've uh, I, I'm just grateful to get through the '80s and '90s without the internet. Right, right, because we wouldn't have we wouldn't have this musical experience that we've all lived through had we had it been different, you know. Oh yeah, no, 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 100%. and. and we, and we and we bonded as as fan, the musicians and fans, the bands and the, and their fan bases. We bonded over the years. I mean, we're all adults now. You know, we've 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 gone through some really tough times together, and uh, we're all still here. Right. You know, I mean, some of us we're, we're losing we lose artists, but yeah. I try and tell people, don't be sad. It's just time. It's like we just lost a great guitar player, Manny Charlton. Manny, yes. Now, you know, and and who produced. Two street, two very important street heart records, oh, and he was right. a very, very. I mean, he produced uh, "Under Heaven Over Hell," uh, and uh, and which which ha which you know Hollywood, uh, "Under My Thumb," "Here Comes the Night." Uh, so Manny is really a, an important part of the street heart legacy, but you know, we lose artists, and the longer that we live, the more of them are going to go. But we, just have to, we have to celebrate that. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's coming for all of us. And I don't mean that badly. I just mean that. It's real. It's reality. We, we have this, we, 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 this wonderful existence, you know, we're these wonderful species that, and we've, we've, and we've all grown up in this amazing time. We've lived in the time of David Bowie and the Beatles and Prince. And, and Led Stevie Zeppelin. Wonder and Wonder and Led Floyd Zeppelin. And oh, <laughs> you know, we, we, we lived through this and we got to have fun and we got to have, we got to do some crazy uh, stuff, you know, that we got, that we survived. Yeah. And it didn't get amazing. documented. It didn't get documented. <laughs> I'm grateful for that. So yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that does think it'd be nice to have more pictures from those days and other times I'm kind of grateful for it. But um, you're, exa you're exactly right, Jeff. Like we, we really can complain about everything and you, and you're right. As we get older, you know, it's a circle of life. People are going, you know, they're going to leave and, and we can only just be grateful for it all that we were a part of it and that we lived during it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, that we lived to see these people live and, and be there when they were coming out. And, well, it's just, the, it's, it's, it's just, it not only changed our individual lives, but it affected us all as a culture. Yes. Uh, and uh, it's something that I will always be eternally grateful for. I mean, like I, I, I say next to my mom and dad, the, the four most important adults in my life were John, Paul, George, and Ringo. Yeah, yeah, no. They're the most 100%. influential adults in my life, next to my mother and father. You know, right. and then then there's a list of musicians after that, and a few people start to pop in. But next to mom and dad, it's the Beatles for me. Those are the four most important people in my life, uh, uh, who have influenced the, the, the direction of my life. Right. And what are you listening to these days, Jeff? I'm curious. 
Who am I listening to? Yeah. Um, well, I've been I've been listening to a lot of my own tracks. I've been sort of I've been doing some just working on some stuff here. Um, I I kind of you know I I go. I go looking for music, but I'm so busy with the business of the music right now. Right. Like, you know, like I don't think I've really taken a whole lot of time to listen to anything for the last six weeks. Like it's for me, it's, you know, I mean, the business of rock and roll is a business and it, re and it, it requires, sure, it's, we're going to go play a show, but you have to book flights and you have to make sure you have ground transportation. You have to make sure the people are available and, it, it all has to be done seamlessly, you know? And right. I, I mean, I, I do that work. I love to do that work. Uh, I think I'm pretty good at it. And uh, my bandmates, they're worth the extra, they're, they're worth the work. And to get to see the fans at the end of all that work makes right. it all worthwhile. Makes it, makes it all worthwhile, 100%. So yeah, so new music. I mean, I mean, there's a few, I mean, I'm uh, one of my favorite, uh, uh, I love Glorious Sons. I love that band. I love them too. Band. Yeah, they, great they've band. been here a couple of times. Yeah, super. There, see, there is some good new music coming out for sure. Oh no, there's, there's. there's I mean, there's, yeah. there's, there's so much great music out there. There's so many. I've, I've had the great opportunity of recording some young artists, probably artists that you may never hear because there's so many artists out there. Um, you know, great singers, great songwriters. Um, they, it's, it's so difficult to get noticed because. There's so play. many. Well, there's 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 so many people in the field. Like I, right. they, they, there was a statistic about where they talked about. I think in the eighty, it's somewhere in the eighties, there were, there was approximately five thousand releases a year, worldwide wow. from record. We're at five thousand, uh, and s somewhere in the in. in like 2009, there were 900,000 releases. Wow. 81% of those have sold less than 100 copies. Right. So, and, there, and there's nowhere for them to perform to support their albums either. Well, you can't. You, you know, can't, can, right? So. Well, I, 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 people play clubs for less, less money than we made in the 70s, right. the 80s. You yeah. know, uh, I don't know how that all got that way, but I feel that working musicians are really taken advantage of. Uh, I mean, I think it just goes without saying, you know, offering somebody to come and jam for a free beer or a drink is like, if you want to do that, great. But for a working musician, I mean, it goes back to the earlier part of our conversation. When we were lucky enough to be able to have a job playing music so we could learn how to be better. 100%. And that's where we all come. That's where we come from. I mean, uh, that's where Kenny Shields comes from. That's where Daryl Gutal comes from. Spider Cine, Paul Dean, uh, Paul Dean, and Matthew Fernet were playing in a band called the Great Canadian River Race when I was playing in a club band called Shama, and during the, the circuit in Western Canada. And this is in the this sort of the late seventies. We're all just kind of doing our thing, and fortunately, some of us were able to get were lucky enough and be associated with the right people that we were able to get a be part of a record deal and get records out there. And now we have songs that we can continue to play now. Right. Yeah, absolutely, Jeff. And, you know, we did get a question that I, I want to at least answer this one question. Okay. Uh, so this is directed at you. And um, I think it was from Ed Schultz. And he wants to know, what is your go-to guitar? Uh, my go-to guitar? Well, obviously, when I play live, it's it's Frank, my white Stratocaster. Right. And you're a lefty. It's, yeah, I'm a lefty. It's yeah. my number one. Uh, it's my number one guitar. Uh, it just... It just does, it never fails. It's like a hammer. You pull it out and you hit something. It just, and it put, it hammers a nail. Uh, it's, this is a no frills guitar. And I love that one. I mean, I have, when I'm in the studio, I would say I have a, uh, I have a, uh, a reissue of a 1957, uh, a gold top Les Paul that I think is the finest instrument that I own. Right. Uh, it's what, it's one of my favorites. Um, I have a handful of them. I have a great telly, great Telecaster. I have a, uh, a beautiful Gretsch 6120 Chet Atkins guitar that w Gretsch does a thing that no other guitar does, Gretsch. <laughs> you know, so, uh, and, and, uh, but if I'm writing, I'll, I pick up my, I, I'll, I'll pick up my uh, Gibson J45 because all great songwriters write an acoustic guitar. Oh, there you go. Or and piano. you know, Frank, Frank must be like that old pair of jeans, that, that favorite pair of jeans that you just 
like your yes. go-to jeans, right? Yeah. Oh, oh no. I mean, I bought that guitar brand new in 1975. Uh, um, um, there, and, and it's done every tour, every record that I've ever done. Uh, I've I've done thousands of shows with it. I've dropped it hundreds of times. I've broken the neck off it. I put <laughs> I put about a dozen different sets of pickups in it. Right. Uh, the original. It's a, anyone who's seen it knows it's 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 got character. It's beat up, but it's always been loved. It's always been admired. It's always been respected, and oh. it sits right beside me on the airplane. Oh, yeah, you don't want to put that into storage or anything. Oh, no, no, no. I oh never lose sight of that guitar. I never lose sight of that guitar. No, it's, I, I, I get, you know, I, it's just, it's an important instrument to me. So. 100%. Just a quick note here. Sean Tiedemann is saying hello from Sean and Sage. Hey, Sean and Sage. Actually knows. Hey, guys, thanks for popping in. I just want to take a second and thank my official Etc. Live show sponsors, Writers and Rockers Coffee Company. Nice. Uh, yeah, they are the official sponsors of, like, the, the coffee to the rock stars. I have here... Uh, Todd Kern's Damn It Brew. Nice. So yeah, it's just damn good coffee. So you can uh, check out their website, which Ed is always on my face. Who do we have here? This is Eddie Van Howland. <laughs> I'm on dog patrol for the... Oh, yes, Eddie. Oh. Yes, good boy. Yes. Oh, hi, Eddie. Yeah, Ren's in the overnight shift at the hospital tonight, so I am <laughs> on dog patrol. So Ed and Lola are keeping me company and running me, running me off my feet. So. Oh, yeah, I love dogs. And you're not, the, it's not the first dog to be on the air on the show. So that's, they're yeah. always welcome here. No, they've been just, they've been sort of bugging me here. And, and here, and here's little Lola B. Come on. No, okay. She's not coming. In. She's, yeah, she's, she's camera shy. No, she, no, she's not camera shy. She's actually, she loves the spotlight. She's just, she's a, okay, you two. Anyways. That's enough, okay. Enough just, of doggos. Yes. I'm kind of a serious note. What makes you happy? What makes you the happiest these days? Well, these two little mutts make me happy. Um, I, bet. I, I think that I have a I, I have a wonderful partner, uh, and she's been and Renata's been such a rock for me. She makes me happy every day. We were talking about as we were talking about earlier. Not only do I love her, I really like her. Like her, you know, like. And we were talking about how important it is that like is when you see somebody when they walk in a room and you go, you know, it's so. My family makes me happy. Um, getting out and seeing the fans always yeah. makes me happy right. i mean it, it makes all the hard work because it's it's been a very stressful year this year trying to set up a tour trying to deal with all the problems i'm not the only one we all we're all dealing with right. it. all of my colleagues talk about the same thing um it's um it, it's been really hard i mean i've had i'll wake up in the middle like going oh i forgot to book a ticket and i'll be I'll like and i just, just panicking. You know, and, and panicking you know yeah not not panicking but just go because i don't i don't panic uh, I've learned not to do that because right. I learned that there's not the, you don't have to panic. All you have to do is just go, okay, what needs to be done? What, what's the next move? What's the next move? And you just yeah. do it and you don't procrastinate. You just do it. Okay. So all that work, seeing the fans at the end of it, that makes me happy. Um, uh, golf makes me happy. Oh, good, you know? good. Yeah, I like to get out and play. I, I mean, it's it just, it's nice to get a bit of a break from the music because it's so, it's something we do so much of. You know, um, but but I just think that the fact that we've had such a a, a great long career uh, and that we're still able to be doing this, uh, it's it's astounding to me. Like it's just uh, I cannot believe that we're still here. Right. You know, after all these years, and it's that's it's all about the fans and the fans. I, I think the connection that our band has with our fans, and I'm sure every band can say the same thing, but <laughs> but. The connection that we have with our fans that makes me happy. Knowing that we have friends that are coming on and hanging out with here, hanging out with us here tonight. Um, these are the kind of things that really warm my heart. That really that that kind of always make me want to be the best version of myself that I can be. One hundred percent. Well, you know what makes us happy, Jeff? Street art, street art, and the music continuing. Oh, uh, thanks, the fact guys. that you're still out there bringing us the music. The fact that you came and took time to be on the show tonight. Oh, that that I, makes I, me happy. I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It's just like uh, you're you're doing such a great job, and uh, I, I have I had a couple of, of uh, people this, at the end say, "Why don't you turn the tables on Kelly and start interviewing her?" So, <laughs> Kelly, when did it all start for you? <laughs> well, I was a wee child in Regina. 
Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, uh, someday, listen, you, someone actually does need to sit down and talk to you. And I'm sure that there are a lot of people out there who would love to hear your story, too. Oh, well, thank you, Jeff. In I, detail. I really appreciate that. In detail. I have been on a couple of shows, actually, uh, in. Uh, out east, uh, that Good. was a while okay. back. But yes, I would welcome that anytime. Yeah, to, well, yeah. I, I'd like to be part of that panel when that happens anyway. Oh, right. But I know You're that, on. I mean, but, but, but I, there's so many of us that are so grateful for what you do. And you do, you do a, a, it's a, a wonderful show that you put together. I know Thank that it's you. a lot of work and it's a, it's, it, there's a lot of love uh, that, you ha that has to go into this to make this happen. And so and good on you for that. You're doing a great job. Thank you so much, Jeff. I appreciate that. It is my passion. It is a labor of love. I feel honored to bring mm. the fans their favorite artists. I feel honored every time uh, an icon such as yourself says, yes, they'll come on. I'm grateful. I love it. Jeff, I just cannot thank you enough. Uh, you know, we love you. We respect and admire you. We just want to keep hearing what you do. So just keep it coming. Keep it coming. We will never get enough of street art. Yeah. And, uh, and thank you so much for being such a huge part of, of the soundtrack to all of our lives. Mm. Uh, Kelly, yeah. Kelly, thank you. Thank you. I mean, and for all of our fans out there, uh, we wouldn't be here without you. And we love you all. And uh, Kelly, we love what you do. And uh, just, you know, hang in there. Everybody be safe. We're going to see you all as soon as we can. And we can't wait to do that. Right on. Thanks so much. And everybody, by the way, you can check out uh, the Streetheart website. Uh, is, link is scrolling along the bottom of your screen. Check out shows, merchandise, mm -hmm. all things Streetheart there. Uh, once again, huge shout out to Writers and Rockers Coffee Company for being my sponsors and helping me bring this show to you every week. Hey, Robert. Uh, Robert Young. And uh, hey, next week, Lee Aaron, the beautiful and talented Lee Aaron is coming back yes. for her third appearance on etc. We're so, looking forward to playing with Lee. We're going to be playing uh, with Lee Aaron uh, at uh, Maple Ridge Rocks. That's going to be August the uh, 12th. August 12th. That's right. And, and you have a date of August 5th at the new Elma Combo, too. Yeah, we're playing the, uh, th that weekend, we're playing the Alma Carbo on, on August the 5th, and then we're going up to uh, Little Current on Manitoulin Island to play Rock the Rock, Rock and the Rock on August the 6th. Um, I've got to get in my website and update our calendar. We've got a whole bunch of shows out there, folks. Right so we, we're, we're going to try and get to see as many people as we can this year, Kelly. Right on. We can't wait to see you. And uh, yeah, everybody, thank you so much for watching. I really, really appreciate you so much. Take care and uh, stay safe and sane. We'll see you next week and be nice to each other. Bye-bye. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night.